Welcome to another edition of RCE. I'm your host, Brock Palin. I have again Jeff Squires from Cisco Systems, the Open MPI Project, and the author of the wonderful MPI Performance Blog. <laughs> well, there you go. It is a fabulous blog, and I truly recommend everybody read the pearls of wisdom that drip out of it. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, it is a great place to kind of get a, a view into what's happening in the upcoming MPI standards and stuff. You yeah, put comments the deep, on there. deep, dark, secret world of MPI. Mm-hmm. And we have a link to that blog off of the RCE website at rce-cast.com. Um, and from there, there are RSS feeds and the regular iTunes subscription link if you're into that sort of thing. And there's also a nomination form where you can recommend people we should talk to or topics we should talk about. And actually, that's something about today. Normally, we talk about a software project. Today, we're talking about something all of us had to go through at one time who run a cluster. We're talking to brand new high performance computing sysadmins. Yeah, ch- change it up a little bit today. So it ch- it change the focus off learning about new and interesting things in HPC, but rather talk to people who are are new to HPC um, and and see how we as a community are doing about you know welcoming new people and getting them up to speed on education and hardware and software and stuff like that because brock you and i have been doing this for forever it's so easy to get jaded and to forget that you know it's it's actually our responsibility to bring new people in so yeah yeah so we were supposed to have uh two admins um that were nice enough to agree to join us but i'm guessing one is unavailable probably because of a problem with his high performance computing cluster as we've all been there (laughs) we've even canceled one of these recordings before because i had a system not quite literally on fire, but it was very, very close. <laughs> um, so our guest that we have on right now, and if our other guest becomes available, we'll call him in later, is Andre Gautier from Yale, if I have that right. I might that, that correct. straight here. That's, that's yeah. So why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself and specifically why did Yale decide to get into the high-performance computing realm? Uh, well, first off, uh, I've been in IT for uh, over a decade. Um, I was a sysadmin before that, uh, before HPC, and uh, I worked for a research lab that had uh, a very um, had uh, big time, huge re- um, compute requirements um, that uh, they were they were, they were constantly running out of. Um, CPUs and storage, and they had multiple discrete servers, and so I saw an opportunity to fix their their problem, and and uh, I thought of HPC, and that's sort of how I got started. But they 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 had uh, they had dramatic requirements for a CPU and storage, and they were I/O bound, and they had many discrete servers, so. Um, There was constant manual load balancing going on, so users shuffling from one server to another, and it wasn't ideal. So um, as you can see, that that would probably be a good fit for HPC because a lot of their processes were were not necessarily parallel but sequential. So they would do parameter sweeps hundreds at a time, so it was perfect for HPC. So what uh, what department, what kind of field is this in? Is this somebody who, you know, HPC just doesn't normally occur to, like uh, well, you know, this physics? Is a, or- when I first uh, started in this lab, this is a, a computer science lab in, at UMass uh, that specialized in search engines. Uh, so at, at the time, Google hasn't – Google wasn't on the scene, and a lot of people weren't talking about HPC. So it wasn't – Something it wasn't something that someone would think of instantly, you know, as a solution, a possible solution to their uh, their dilemmas. So, so the requirements for this uh, cluster then was the ability to have large I/O and then to run uh, large numbers of serial jobs, or or perhaps even uh, embarrassingly parallel jobs. Is that right? That's correct. Um, and so uh, I knew that there had to be a better way of doing this. Uh, rather than manually shuff, shuffling users back and forth and moving data back and forth. Um, so I came up w- with an idea of s- stringing a few computers together 
And uh, I started looking at schedulers and things like that. And then I sort of, you know, came across a lot of HPC stuff and figured that's the way to go. The being, being I.O. bound, that, that's a little different. Most people always think about what's your top Linpack performance and how many CPUs and how many cores do you have and what's your clock speed. Yeah, so I wasn't at that level of HPC yet, right? So it was more about how do I solve their problems so that they get uh, better throughput in their research uh, rather than always waiting on I.O. or having to move stuff around. So it was more of a practical solution, right, rather than I want just high performance. So it also solved our problems of having downtimes on servers that people relied on. So uh, when I first started, we had a bunch of big, uh, big Solaris boxes, you know, and people would log into that and do their research, run their processes, and they would do that, um, you know, on multiple machines. And sometimes they would hog more than one. Uh, sometimes uh, one would be completely loaded and they want to move on to another one. And so they would have to copy their data. So I thought, first, we have to centralize these resources. Um, and NFS was way too slow uh, for what they were doing. Um, so it seemed at the time. And so, uh, so this sort of just came into fruition just over time as I thought about it. It's like, okay, I want to centralize the storage. I want to, I want to create easy access for the researchers so they don't have to jump from machine to machine. And I really was naive about HPC and then it sort of you know, fell into it. And I started putting together what our requirements were going to be for this thing. Um, uh, so what so, kind of requirements did you end up with? What, what, what was the final set of things that you started shopping around with? Well, it had to be NFS for worst case scenario. At best case scenario, it had to beat our local drives, which at the time were not that great. Um, so I knew I could do it. Um, so NFS, you know, I think back then I was getting like not really horrible performance. I, you know, we were just getting into gig E. So it was like 20 megs per second at first, I think. And uh, the disk was not that great either. Local drives, we had um, RAID 5, SCSI attached. I don't remember what the RPMs were, but we weren't getting more than 40 to 50 megs per second. So, um, our, so the new infrastructure that would be in place could easily beat that, you know. Um, so that was my worst case scenario. Uh, and it, so I knew that NFS on a dedicated network could beat that performance if I couldn't get a, a, a cluster file system too. So like I said before, you're talking about your main focus here was I.O. bound because you understood your specific problem. One thing we'd like to talk right. about is, is your experience with vendors getting quotes, even knowing what to get quotes for or bidding for things. Here's what they always ask me. Well, what's your application? We'll give you this set of tunings. I have 500 unique users on the cluster I run. <laughs> None of them run the same thing. <laughs> so, right? Yeah, I know. That's 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 sort of after. So that was in the beginning, right? And so as we matured a little bit more into that space, um, we knew exactly what our parameters were um, for the given processes. So we, you know, for the next gen HPC that for our lab, I had, you know, five megs per second per process. Um, and if that, if we were to have eight cores, that would be like 40 megs per second. And if you had, you know, X amount of nodes and you multiply that by the nodes and that's what our, our file system would have to deliver. Um, but after that, you know, after it was a success where I was working, other people wanted to mimic what we were doing, so we started building more generic uh, general resources. And that's where you know, I, I had to generalize uh, the performance more. Is the group you work with now a, a generic research computing resource for Yale? Yes, yeah, that's right. So it's, a, it's the HPC group for all of Yale. So it's uh, for all the research scientists at Yale. 
So what kind of resources do you do you make available? Do you have a couple of large scale general purpose clusters then? We do. We have we have two right now that are online and we have a third coming online soon that's in beta and then we have multiple clusters that we support for specific groups so why did you go the route of having separate clusters and not like confine them inside a a reservation concept so you have one management domain or one point of login yeah so um i find this is a common problem in academics. Um, when I was at UMass, we had this situation where uh, I wanted to create this common HPC group and I wanted, or a resource, right? I wanted a common cluster. It was really difficult to convince other professors or uh, groups that had specific funding from NSF to uh, co-mingle with other research. Um, there was political considerations. There was uh, you know, there was considerations, will my resources be used, uh, available when I need them? And then there was the uh, legal considerations, right? Because it's grants from NFS uh, or, or NSF, uh, you know, can you actually share that with anyone else if it's dedicated for a specific type of research? That's funny because we're actually uh... – at the University of Michigan Ann Arbor, where I work, we're currently fighting with this right now. In the College of Engineering, we've done the monolithic cluster. Users get cluster nodes that they buy with their funds, either startup funds or grant funds, and they're bolted on, but they are theirs. Yeah, right. We're going to an allocation model and making sure that it's, oh, what's it called? Section 17, Section 14, something like that. Basically, NSF funds can go towards it. That's a lot of work that's still in progress. And it's amazing how much work has to be done just to get past the grant process before any you, you're even getting a hardware bid on. Right. And so you cut out there for a little bit, so I didn't catch uh, the first part of that statement. Oh, well, we're doing the condo model. Like we have one big cluster where everybody who buys knows – they get bolted on, but it's dedicated to them. We we put a Moab standing reservation on it, and only they can use it. Okay. But to us, it looks like one cluster, it runs one software load. We have one loading system. We have one resource manager, one set of logins. Yeah, okay, I like that. Um, yeah, so we're looking at a, maybe an allocation-based model in the future. But anyway, so what kind of hardware do you do you have in your in your two call, let's call it two and a half clusters, right? So you have two clusters and one more that's coming out of uh, beta. There, what what kind of uh, nodes? How many nodes? What kind of interconnect? What did you end up uh, getting for your general purpose HPC? Um, so the two older clusters we have uh, DDR, I believe IB for for the network. And actually, we, it, it's split up. We have one cluster has regular Gigi, and the other one has uh, DDR. Um, and we generally go with chassis uh, with blade servers. Um, we find that that you know the the power consumption's better, the, the cooling's a little better, um, the cooling requirements and a little bit easier to manage. Um, with the newer stuff, I'm more familiar with the newer stuff because I just started at Yale this year. Um, and when I came on board, um, that was what we were going to start working on. The equipment was just starting to arrive. So um, we have two clusters, uh, or I'm sorry, we have one that's general that has 128 uh, nodes, uh, dual quad core Nehalems, uh, each with 32 gigs of RAM in each node. And um, they're diskless. Um, and the, the interconnect is quad uh, QDR IB. Um, and we're using the QLogic switch for the master switch. And each chassis has a, ma- a Mellanox switch. Um, and that Mellanox, which is actually pretty interesting, it's it's a module that sits in the chassis 
that has 16 ports that face inward to the nodes or uh, the backplane and 16 ports that face outwards to, uh, to the network. It's kind of funny because the first system you talked about, how you got started down this route, was a I.O. bound serial farm. Right. So, right. And uh, that's, I mean, this, but those after, uh, this was at UMass. So, um, you know, that's how I gained my background in HPC just over time. And, you know, at some point I knew that I wanted to be in HPC. So I moved on to Yale. But um, I, when, when I was at UMass, after these resources uh, were put in place, after these clusters were put in place, the re- requirements changed, right? So it was no longer that way. I mean, it was that, it was that way in the, the beginning where people would submit these, uh, you know, 10,000 jobs that were parameter sweeps. But as they evolved to use the resources better, a lot of processes started to become more parallel. And the world came to HPC. Um, by the time that I was re- getting ready to move on, we were adopting a Hadoop. So were there new things that you had to learn to come into the HPC, like, uh, for example, InfiniBand and Open Fabrics and, and MPI, particularly coming from a, a serial job farm and, and parameter sweeps and things like that? How high was the learning bar that you had to get to to effectively be able to deploy and understand and manage this kind of stuff? Yeah, actually, I thought about that, and that's a good question. Um, that was one of my major concerns was the OFED stack. Uh, the learning curve on that is huge. Um, uh, I was, and I that was I was sort of in the dark before coming to Yale, so that was the thing I had to focus on. And I really started learning more about IB as we had issues with it. So um, you know, you really don't learn until you get your hands dirty. Um, but yeah, it's I found that daunting. Compared to anything else, you have to learn in HPC. I mean, the MPI, OFED, and IB are probably, a, to me, the most complex piece of the puzzle. I'll, I'll tell you, it's very complex software too. Just from <laughs> right. I mean, it, experience. even like I mean, if you consider like scheduling, you'd think that would be complex, and that's not that's not trivial either. Um, you know, I I was I was an SGE shop moving to a PBS Pro shop, now moving to a Torque Maui shop, you know, or move. So, um, and uh, if you come from the SGE world, it's, it's, it was really difficult to wrap my head, head around PBS Pro or Torque Maui's uh, way of doing things because it's kind of different, kind of different. Um, yeah, they're totally different. Right. Give I us mean, a- they're totally- I, the way I look at it is SGE is like um, learning Java before learning C++ because uh, when you start, you know, when you look at PBS Pro, I'm sorry, if you, when you look, look at Maui and Tor, you have, you know, all these parameters and it's more broken down for you. And uh, it's, I think it's a little bit more complex in the beginning uh, to set up and configure correctly. Uh, but uh, it's more powerful in the end. So in regards to your experience of, you know, uh, learning all this new stuff and able to deploy, you know, a a large scale system for general purpose HPC, give us one positive and one negative in your experience, you know, something that worked out really well and something that was just difficult to, uh, to overcome or difficult to understand and learn and deploy. Okay. Um, so I think what was really difficult for me was wrapping my head around um, customization here at Yale. Uh, wasn't used to that because I, I, you know, I would stand up clusters with rocks, and so that's sort of a, a, a really easy way of doing it, right? So rocks you can you know throw in a DVD and hit go and have a cluster up relatively fast if you didn't have to do too much configuration. Um, so I had to wrap my head around a lot of cu- customization. So that took some time, and that was very difficult. And I think that as, as, as an organization, I would probably recommend to, 
stick with something that's adopted widely. Uh, so we're so we have moved to rocks on one of our clusters, and that was that went pretty well. Uh, we're looking at XCAT as a possibility. So that I think is very difficult, and I think that would be difficult for anybody uh, coming into a new situation. Um, so that sort of speaks to standards. Um, so one of the things that went well, um, well, oh, dig deep, you got to find something for us. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, you know, this setting up the storage went really well. We went with a, a, a vendor this time rather than building luster from scratch. So that, uh, it took no time to get that up and going. Um, uh, so, uh, that was pretty cool. Um, uh, you know, and we also, when we moved to the new clusters, we moved to new scheduling. So that was a challenge, I, but I, I enjoyed that challenge and I got to learn uh, a new piece of software, which was Torque Maui. So I enjoyed that a lot. Um, and I'm still learning it. I still have a ways to go um, as far as the, uh, the Maui portion goes. Um, you know, and we're not, we're not going into full Moab yet. So you sort of have to work around the shortcomings of Maui. Um, but so, um, but I, in general, I thought it was pretty exciting. It was, a, um, you know, I got to learn a whole new layer of hardware. Um, you know, we had, I think we had a lot of difficulty standing up our new clusters because we're, you know, pushing the cutting edge of new equipment uh, with the QDR stuff. And we had some bugs we had to work through there. Um, so, yeah, um, but all I, the way I look at it is all these challenges are interesting and fun to me. So, so uh, I should admit here that I ran into Andre and offered him to be a guest on this show at MoabCon, where I assume you were, that was kind of where you were getting spun up on Torque and Moab and Maui? That's correct. Um, and I can tell you, as a place that uses Maui on two machines and Moab on our big machine, I know it costs money, but go to Moab. <laughs> oh, my gosh. All the problems that have existed in Maui for so long, and people are still working on Maui. It's not I, It's not like they're intentionally keeping Maui, like, dumb. Um, right, I mean... It's just we, Moab's fleshed out yeah and uh i mean like i have to solve uh, an issue with floating licenses which of course you know uh maui maui does not have you know doesn't integrate with that you know it doesn't have an option for floating license it doesn't integrate with flex lm were, were you the one who asked that on the maui mailing list just today <laughs> that was me yeah <laughs> that, that was you okay that was funny <laughs> so actually i have on some the maui list yeah yeah moving on from this so you ended up using um, all these things, but also sounds like you're responsible for loading and tying together and running your own networking. Uh, how much integration yep. do you guys actually do and have you found is successful integrating with like your normal central IT? Yeah, so uh, I think that uh, I, so again, this I think this is uh, a academic issue as well um, uh, where where traditionally your traditional networks are, you know, maintained by your network services and your central ITS departments or groups. And so trying to pull that back into your domain is, 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 it's, it's not easy to do. And, and so that's, that again, that has to do with centralizing our resources and, and, um, making sort of one big HPC domain. Um, I think, uh, that, that would be a goal of ours in the future. Um, but yeah, it's, it's a, it's a challenge. Um, uh, and especially when you, you talk to other groups who really don't understand what it is that you do yet. Um, so yeah, um, I think that's a challenge that, uh, I, but I think over time, HPC is really growing fast, right? So people are starting to understand what it is and what, what you have to do and what the networking is all about and how important that is. So, uh, the understanding is, 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 is being disseminated out there. Um, 
So now you mentioned a couple of packages there already. So, you know, Moab and uh, the, the scheduling and things like that. What, what other software packages are you using both middleware and applications and things like that? And then to, to keep this kind of on the theme of integration here, how well did they integrate into your existing environment? Like does your MPI talk to your scheduler? Um, do, does your scheduler talk to your enterprise authentication system? Uh, stuff like that. How well did that mesh together and how much did you have to glue and duct tape yeah, yourself? Yeah, that's a good question because um, the uh, – Open MPI, uh, we had to we use a lot of different uh, versions of MPI, and but we're primarily supporting Open MPI, and of course that Yay. all broke. <laughs> <laughs> that all broke when uh, uh, we uh, put Torque and Maui in place. So we had to recompile everything for the Torque and Maui libraries, right? Um, because previously they were reporting to. The, uh, they were pointing to PBS Pro uh, to integrate with the schedulers properly. Uh, MPitch, as you know, does not integrate with any scheduler, and you have to you have to institute some sort of cleaning cleaning up script. You know, you have to uh, clean up the uh, uh, the lurking processes on various nodes. So um, that's one reason why I would like to move away from MPitch. Now, how about other stuff like your your enterprise authentication and and uh, accounting and any other you know right. central it, Yale resources? Did right. You, so that was a, a that was another concern, and uh, actually, it wasn't too difficult for us. Um, uh, it really, really, really was simple. Uh, we didn't have to worry too much about that. Uh, everything just kind of worked out of the box. So. We got lucky there. Uh, we, you know, we use various. We have our own central authentic- authentication service that we point uh, the PAM modules to, and it's just not an issue. I can tell you at Michigan, I'm the main user support software guy, and I have a software library of a couple hundred titles of multiple versions of MPI, math libraries, and then we have a right. bunch of commercial codes too. The end user commercial codes have been the biggest fight. If they support a batch system, because they wrap around MPI run if they have one, they never let you just run MPI run. Yeah, okay. If they support a batch system, okay. they support NQS. I don't even know what NQS is. Maybe I'm showing my youngness here. But what <laughs> the heck is NQS? Jeff? Yeah, I've never heard of it. So. <laughs> it's a much older batch system that I don't think anybody uses. Well, no, never say never. I'm sure there's somebody still using it out there, but it's it's one of these, you know, uh, schedulers from, gosh, I don't know, the 90s, the 80s. I, I, I never used it myself, but I remember it was kind of right before yeah. my time. And so in my experience, the whole process of every application's way of how they want processes, none of them use TM or some other – TM's PBS is a process launching mechanism, right. so you don't have to clean stuff up. Um, so what do you do with these these multiple uh, instances of open MPI and and different versions of probably GCC and things like that? How do you maintain user environments? Um we use modules. What do you do about that? We use modules. Yeah, that's what we do too. Yeah, modules.sourceforge.net. Modules are good. Yeah, no. Yeah, no, that's what we do too. I was just curious if you were doing that as well. Um, and I find that actually, uh, you know, I wasn't using that bef- at UMass before I came here, but I really I find it useful. And you I know, it's that- funny. I, I, I found that uh, modules is kind of like the best kept secret in the world. It tends to be used very heavily in HPC environments, right. but I haven't really seen it used elsewhere, even though – it's not specific to HPC at all, and the guys who developed it had nothing to do with H. Well, no, that's not true. It originally came out of Cray, but you know the, the people who do it now are not doing it specifically for HPC. But uh, this is still, you know, we are are at least from my limited little view from my foxhole. Uh, that's where I see modules used the most. Yeah, I was really shocked that I've never heard of it before I came here. Um, it seems to be a very effective tool. Um, I, I ran into an interesting problem where I, I, uh, one of our software developers 
uh, came across where a user was, um, uh, you know, doing a, a bunch of um, system calls in his C++ code, and that uh, was loading his environment every time. So he was loading all of the modules. So it, his his uh, system call was like four times more expensive than it was on his re- desktop computer, and he couldn't figure out why. So I thought that was really interesting. Well, so this is a great transition. Let's ask how you know how are your users reacting to these HPC environments? Because it, it's not only you know becoming mainline in the enterprise world; it's becoming inter- mainline in in academia as well. But it's still a new you know. It's still new to a whole wide range of people. So how do you educate your users and how well do they utilize, you know, your HPC resources? Um, actually, you know, I can't speak too much about, uh, you know, Yale's environment because I've only been – I haven't even been here a year yet. So – and my interaction with the end user has been pretty limited until now. So – but they seem to be – you know, they seem to catch on really quick um, – and uh, before you know it, they really, you know, they really understand. Uh, they really get HPC, and you know, they're digging down in MPI and and doing all kinds of crazy things. Um, so I'm really impressed with how fast the user community here, um, uh, you know, gets up to speed on HPC. Uh, and we've we've always get you know new users that we're just you know not expecting, like uh, you know people from forestry for example. Um, so, you know, the word is getting out there. And I think that's something we're now moving towards as being, uh, doing more outreach. Um, so I think that will be part of the, the, the group in the future. So I think that should be part of every HPC group because it, it's not, it's not something that, uh, for, for now, it's not something uh, a researcher will have background in when they're, you know, when they want to do research and they haven't experienced HPC. I think in the future, though, I mean, a lot of uh, a lot of universities are now starting to teach that uh, how to, you know, distribute your code and um, and even in, you know, the general sciences. I think they're starting to teach that a little bit more. Yeah, I uh, teach so, the introduction classes to. PBS and even some concepts in MPI and I just finished out a round of sessions and I had 90 people come to those sessions um, at our institution alone and I do this wow, three times cool. a year <laughs> that's I do this three times a year so once every semester and once for spring summer and wow. so yeah no training and it's amazing oh. people's willingness to ask questions in person and it's what a great way to really facilitate research because we have to remember as admins we're not just running boxes and keeping our head down we're facilitating research in the wide words of my boss he came up with this great thing we don't like computers we like computing and if we have to have some computers to do it well damn it we'll have some computers i mean everybody (laughs) wants to have the big box but if it's not enabling anything like what, what are we doing now, Jeff, your situation is a little different. I want you to have a bunch yeah. of computers and make sure this stuff works so then we can use it to enable science. But, you know, <laughs> you do your <laughs> thing and yeah. we'll consume. So, Andre, let me, we're, we're running a little short on time here. Let me ask you uh, one kind of wrap-up question here. If, uh, you know, knowing what you know now, uh, what would you recommend to somebody who's, who's just starting down this path from, from the admin side? What should they learn? Where should they go look? What should they pay attention to? Um, that's a good question. Um, I think, I, I think you have to be a a very curious person to be in this field. And I think about, I think you have to have a sort of a wide brush of knowledge of science, uh, or a general knowledge of science, right? So, because there's so much different types of research that happens on HPC. So having the ability to speak the language is I think a big help, right? So, uh, you know, I think when you're in college, I think chemistry is important. I think because there's bioinformatics, um, chemistry and biology come in play, uh, your physics, um, you know, of course your, your computer science, uh, I think those are important. And I think also that things that get overlooked, 
and taken for granted is your your communication skills. Um, there's a lot of writing that goes into our job, right? We do a lot of documentation, a lot of communication with the end user, and I think that's very important. Um, so I think those things, those those skills tend to get overlooked. Um, so I think that's. I think th- to me those are important. I mean, just your general cr- curiosity, right, um, and your willingness to learn new things because uh, HPC is always re- uh, it's always changing and and revolving and and or evolving. And uh, uh, I think that if you if you're not you know a curious person, you just you're just not going to grow in this field. Um, uh, but as far as of what to look at. Uh, you need to know your networking. Um, you know, get strong on your networking. Um, but uh, Infiniban is completely different than TCIP, TCP IP, of course, and and there really isn't a lot that translates between the two of them. Uh, but if you can come across some IB resources, that's great. Uh, so, and then of course your scheduling, I think that, uh, learning, you know, Maui and Torque are really useful. Um, and also think about if you were to stand up on a club, if you were to build your own cluster, what sort of things, uh, how would you automate that? You know, that's one thing you might want to think about. You can look at rocks or how they do it, but having an understanding how that works or how you would want to uh, approach that, I think is a um, important thing too. Okay. Well, Andre, thanks for your time and um, sharing your experiences with us and how you transitioned from regular IT and what you found differently in the HPC research computing world and how you progress from a serial farm to a parallel shared resource um, inside your entire institution. Uh, one thing, if you don't mind me adding, a great resource I found, of course, is the mailing list for all the different pieces of middleware um, that we've talked about, OpenMPI, Torque, um, SGE. They all have these mailing lists, have great resources of people who have experienced lots of problems. And, of course, there's always the Beowulf list, which is great for just standard, standard getting started questions. So, Andre, thank you very much. Jeff, thank you for your time, and the show will be up soon. Thank you. All right, thanks.